Hello, members and friends of Grace Church in Harrisburg. We are still here, still here on State Street in the city, uh, in the place where this, uh, this building has stood uh, since about 1870. We're still here um, in ministry, uh, reaching out to you and others uh, throughout the city and the region, um, as a, a vital and active congregation serving Jesus Christ. We are still here. It is still a place of worship and mission and service. I trust that before too many more weeks and months pass, we'll be able to gather in this magnificent sanctuary again and worship God together. In the meantime, we continue to gather in ways like this uh, to worship God uh, separately and to renew our commitments to Christ in the places where we are. It has seemed over the last several months that, um, that we have had from week to week enough to deal with, and that uh, uh, each week something gets worse, and this week has been uh, no different. Uh, we are facing, 
in the week that is coming, a, uh, the momentous inauguration of a new administration in Washington to lead our nation. Um, but the, the, um, uh, the issues that have been raised by the departing administration have been uh, beyond our ability to anticipate and uh, to believe. So we are, we are in prayer these days for our nation uh, and for those who lead us. Uh, we are in prayer for those who are angry and hurt um, and for those who are fearful. We are in prayer for new leaders arriving and old leaders departing. And we continue to be in prayer for those who struggle with racial tensions, those who are dealing with, with a, an increasingly difficult pandemic, and especially those uh, healthcare workers who are on the front line um, trying to care for the sick and at the same time administer vaccines. Um, and I know that in your homes and in your families, uh, you face uh, uh, challenges and difficulties as well. I hope that you are, uh, that you are intimately acquainted also um, with, the, with the blessings uh, and the, the joys of faithfulness and discipleship and the happiness that comes from, uh, from family and from friendship, uh, though we are in, in a difficult time to express both. Would you pray together with me? Shall we pray? We thank you, God, for this place for this place that reminds us of your sovereignty, um, but also of your love and your grace. Help us to keep you uh, firmly in our vision. Despite the things all around us that are not going well, and the things that seem to be deteriorating day by day, new threats that arise and old ones that just hang around, help us to keep our eyes focused uh, on you and upon the grace, uh, the joy, the compassion, the love, and the hope that you bring to our lives. Help us not only to perceive those things, but to be channels of those things to our world and to others. We offer ourselves to you today, along with our prayers, in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Reading from 1 Samuel, chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. 
Now the boy Samuel was serving the Lord under Eli. The Lord's word was rare at that time, and visions weren't widely known. One day Eli, whose eyes had grown so weak he was unable to see, was lying down in his room. God's lamp hadn't gone out yet, and Samuel was lying down in the Lord's temple, where God's chest was. The Lord called to Samuel, I'm here, he said. Samuel hurried to Eli and said, I'm here. You called me? I didn't call you, Eli replied. Go lie down. So he did. Again, the Lord called Samuel. So Samuel got up, went to Eli and said, I'm here. You called me? I didn't call my son, Eli replied. Go and lie down. Now Samuel didn't yet know the Lord. And the Lord's word hadn't yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel. He got up, went to Eli and said, I'm here. You called me? Then Eli re realized it was the Lord who was calling the boy. So Eli said to Samuel, go and lie down. If he calls you, say, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down where he'd been. Then the Lord came and stood there, calling just as before, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel said, Speak, your servant is listening. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. A reading from the 199th chapter of Psalms, verses 1 through 6 and 13 through 18. Lord, you have examined me. You know me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. Even from far away, you comprehend my plans. You study my traveling and resting. You are thoroughly familiar with all my ways. 
There isn't a word on my tongue, Lord, that you don't already know completely. You surround me front and back. You put your hand on me. That kind of knowledge is too much for me. It is so high above me that I can't reach it. You are the one who created my innermost parts. You knit me together while I was still in my mother's womb. I give thanks to you that I was marvelously set apart. Your works are wonderful. I know that very well. My bones weren't hidden from you when I was being put together in a secret place. When I was being woven together in the deep parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my embryo. And on your scroll every day was written what was being formed for me before any one of them had yet happened. God, your plans are incomprehensible to me. Their total number is countless. If I tried to count them, they'd outnumber grains of sand. If I came to the very end, I'd still be with you. Bless this reading of God's word. Amen.
We are now into the season of Epiphany. Epiphany means, of course, the coming of the light, a time when we, we uh, review some of the ways that people recognized Jesus and began to recognize Jesus for who he was. An interesting thing we discover in looking at the Gospels at this time of year, in Matthew and Luke, we find extensive stories of the nativity. We encounter the shepherds, the wise men, the journey to Bethlehem, the stable, the star, and so on. Uh, but in the, the Gospels of Mark and John, uh, there are no nativity stories. Uh, the, the writers of those Gospels jump right into the, um, uh, the story of Jesus and his public ministry. Uh, in, in Mark's Gospel, as we discovered last Sunday, um, uh, he, he moves very quickly from an introduction to John the baptizer at the beginning of Mark's gospel to, uh, to Jesus' baptism, uh, Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, and, and um, uh, Jesus' uh, calling of the disciples, all of that in just the first chapter of Mark. Today, we turn to John's gospel, where we find, um, after a, a brief uh, uh, cosmic introduction, uh, NRK in Halagos, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, we move to, uh, again, to, to John the Baptizer, uh, bearing testimony to Jesus and who he was, and then very quickly to um, uh, Jesus calling his disciples. And then at the beginning of the, uh, the second chapter of John, we encounter something very surprising. Uh, Jesus then uh, uh, runs the money changers out of the temple, the, the traditional cleansing of the temple story. In all the other Gospels, that event takes place at the end of Jesus' public ministry uh, during his, his last week in Jerusalem at the temple just before the crucifixion. But in John's Gospel, it begins Jesus' public ministry. So today, uh, John chapter 1, beginning at verse 43, Jesus is calling some of his disciples. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you come to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do not believe because I have told you. Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is the gospel of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, we are still in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, though in 2021 there is some hope off in our future that we will indeed gain control over this virus and get back to some semblance of life as normal. I am looking forward as you are, to the time when we can gather again in the sanctuary of Grace Church, where I'm standing now, though I'm the only one here at this moment. It will be good to gather again and to experience uh, the fellowship that we desire so much with each other and the, uh, the focus on God that we are able to achieve when we gather in this place. I'd like to begin with a story about... Uh, uh, one woman's reflections on what it's like to gather in church for Sunday school and for worship. Uh, in one of her books, uh, Annie Dillard 
notes the curious way in which we come to church on Sundays, something I hope we'll be doing again soon. Here we are, she said, with padded pews and carpeted sanctuaries. Everything is orderly, neat, tied down, and respectable. And yet, she says, if you know how much about the Bible, if you know much about the Bible and what it says about what it's like to meet God, then the ushers ought to be handing out crash helmets rather than bulletins. If you look at our church and its program, it looks like a great place to hang out, a good place for people of all ages, children, youth, choirs, quilters, scouts, Bible studies, such a wholesome place it is. But is that what God had in mind? Is that what God was hoping for? A teacher of mine told a story about uh, sitting in an airport waiting room one day, waiting to board the plane, watching in horror as an enterprising four-year-old demolished an entire wing of the airport terminal, turning over trash cans, stepping on ice cream cones, tracking it all over the seats. His helpless, terrified parents sat watching him in befuddlement, having no idea what to do to control their child. While the flight was called and the passengers were saved from annihilation, just in the nick of time, he said. As they were leaving the waiting room and boarding the plane, he overheard what the father said to the mother. Dear, perhaps we ought to consider taking Thomas to Sunday school. Maybe that would help. Well, my teacher uh, reflected on that plan of action, wondering which Sunday school in which church could take on the task of taming that little pagan. But is that what Sunday school is for? Is that what church is for? Taming and civilizing and subduing? I hope you were attentive to the reading uh, from 1 Samuel, which you heard just a few minutes ago. As a boy, the adopted son of a priest, young Samuel spent a great deal of time hanging around the church. He helped old Eli out. The old priest's eyes were growing dim, and he could use a boy to fetch things for him and just to help him throughout the day. And the temple is, after all, a good place for a young boy. The writer commented, that the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Well, safe from any disruptive, challenging words of God, people would show up at the temple now and then. They'd go through a few prescribed rituals and then feel better about themselves, and that was about all. Old Eli tottered around, going through the motions, keeping the altar fires lit during the time when the word of God was rare. I've often wondered when I've read that story, why is it that the word of God was rare? Sometimes I suppose God is silent because God has nothing more to say than God has already said. Sometimes God is silent because no one is really listening. Into this situation of, of settled, silent religion, one night little Samuel hears his name called. He doesn't understand the voice at first. He assumes it to be old Eli calling for him to fetch something. But no, it is not the voice of Eli. Three times the voice calls. Samuel, Samuel, and three times the boy goes, goes to old Eli asking, you called? After all, the word of God had been rare. If you hear that voice again, Eli counseled, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. After that, the story does not say that Samuel went back to a peaceful sleep. But the next morning, Eli wanted to know what Samuel heard in the voice of God. Reluctantly at first, 
But then with Eli's urging, the boy tells what he heard. There will be bad times for Eli's house. Eli will fall and young Samuel will rise. That story is so much like many biblical stories. Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Isaiah, Amos, Daniel, Jeremiah, Jonah, Peter, Paul, Jesus, James, John, all of them are stories about people whose lives were moving along in accustomed, conventional, predictable paths only to be disrupted by an intrusive word, only to hear their name called and have their world changed. In today's gospel lesson, John tells how a couple of ordinary people had their lives turned upside down, changed forever by hearing their names called by Jesus. There's a, there's a curious remark that Jesus makes about Nathaniel when Nathaniel says, how is it that you know me? I saw you under the fig tree, Jesus said. What does that mean? What would be the significance of seeing him under the fig tree? A fig tree is about 15 feet tall, and its branches spread out about 25 feet in width, like, like a, an umbrella, creating a space that's, that's almost like a, a, a private shaded room. In those days, if, if someone wanted to get away from the chaos of their one-room house, she or he would go sit under a fig tree. There they would sit to be alone, to have some quiet time. They would sit there to read the scripture, to reflect, or to pray. Sitting under a fig tree was a sign of seeking and praying for God's living presence and for God's guidance. Jesus saw Nathanael under the fig tree and realized that he was there seeking God, seeking God's presence, God's touch, and was thus just the kind of person Jesus needed to follow him. Now, I realize that, that Grace Church looks nothing like a fig tree, but isn't that why we long to be here? We come together here in this place with a yearning to know the touch of the living God. Now, we can do that in other places. We can do that in our homes and in the privacy of the rooms there. But there's nothing like this place where people for generations upon generations have done what we long to do here, to quiet ourselves, open ourselves to the presence of God, and hear our name called by God. Well, these lessons are instructed. The lesson from, from John and also the passage from from 1 Samuel. They are instructive, but they are also a warning to us. Though in times like ours, the word of God may be rare, God is not silent forever. Sometime, someday, some evening, when we are minding our own business, or one Sunday when you're in church just going through the motion, there's a voice you hear your name called, and like little Samuel, like Philip and Nathaniel, our world changes. If you don't want to risk such disruption, then you had better avoid hanging around the temple. Andrew Young, known for being congressman, mayor of Atlanta, United States ambassador to the United Nations, close associate of Dr. Martin Luther King, Andrew Young was ordained in the United Church of Christ. He once told a group of people to whom he was speaking that he was delighted when his eldest daughter became active in the local church where she was living. With each deepening level of her involvement, he became more and more pleased that she had found the church and had embraced faith in God, faith in Jesus for herself. But one day, she announced to her parents that she was going to join the ministry of Habitat for Humanity to build homes for the poor of Uganda. That was not long 
after the fall of Idi Amin, and Uganda was still a very violent place. And then Andrew Young confessed. He said, I tried to talk her out of it. I mean, I, I wanted her to go to church. I wanted her to find a nice Christian man to marry. I wanted her to develop a relationship with God and to settle down. But believe me, I didn't have anything like that in mind. I didn't intend for her to go that far. I mean, Uganda, of all places, in the whole world. But she said she was called. Called by, God had called her name. What could I say? So, so Andrew Young concluded his remarks with this warning. Parents, grandparents, friends, keep in mind, when you bring your children, your grandchildren, your friends, your neighbors, yourself, to church, you may not be prepared for the consequences. It can be dangerous to hang out in the temple and have your children and grandchildren do so because if they do, someday they may hear the voice of the Lord calling them. Some weeks ago, I, um, I met some of my colleagues in a church here in Harrisburg. As I entered the building, I walked past the door to the sanctuary, and I couldn't help but notice the sign hanging above that door. It was red, red, and, and not intended to be missed. Hanging above the door, it said, Silence, please. People at prayer. Well, as I reflect on these stories of Samuel and Philip and Nathaniel, I'm thinking that that sign would better read, or ought to read, Warning, God at work. Well, when it's all said and done, relax. You don't have to be listening. God can get your attention. Even the back row in the church won't protect you. There is nowhere God can't reach. Keep in mind that following Jesus is more an adventure than it is an exercise. You are called just by your association with Jesus and Jesus' people. You are called to have enough conviction to live by your values. You are called to have enough courage to, to speak up in the face of evil. You are expected to have the kind of commitment that is required to call one another to accountability. These are some of the things that Jesus expects of all of us when we claim to be his followers. It's a challenging road to walk, a difficult way. Well, why should it be any easier for us than it was for Jesus himself? So be careful when you come into the church or when you seek to come into God's presence you can be confronted with and faced with unexpected expectations, challenging, a challenging calling, and difficult work to do. It may require all your energy, may require all your resources, it may require your life. Would you pray with me? How grateful we are, God, for the many and various ways that you move within us and among us. Give to us an added measure of your wisdom and your courage and your love and your commitment so that we might truly listen for your voice and respond when you call us to be the people you need us to be and to do the things you need us to do. Free us from all of our superstitions, those kinds of superstitions that tell us that all you want for us is for us to be comfortable and rich and free, when indeed all you want for us is for us to serve the glorious God of the universe 
to aspire to God's values and to honor all people whom we encounter as Jesus honored those whom he encountered, as people God has made, as people God has endowed with life, not only temporal but eternal life. Give to us the courage we need, God, to see ourselves and others and our world the ways that you see them. Hear our prayers for those who struggle today, for it is our calling to throw our lot in with those who struggle, to struggle with them, to love them, to comfort them, to help them, to take their place at times. For those who are struggling because of political circumstances in our country and throughout the world, hear our prayers that they might be courageous and put their trust in you. Hear our prayers for those who struggle with, with physical disabilities and maladies and limitations, for those who are ill and, and for those who struggle to recover from medical interventions, for those who have been afflicted by COVID virus or uh, have, if not themselves, uh, members of their family for whom they care. Show us your healing ways. Give us confidence to know that you are indeed within us and among us, seeking to strengthen us and to call us to our best selves. Move among us with your spirit. Reassure us when we're weak. Direct us when we are strong. Show us your ways when we are receptive. Hear our prayers, O God, for the leadership of the nations, but particularly for the leadership of our nation as we are in transition right now. Help us to see clearly the way forward and grant to those who have been elected to lead us the vision that they need to capture a vision of your values and to live in and through and for them. Move among us with your spirit. Draw us ever closer to one another and closer to you. For we offer ourselves to you along with our prayers in the name and the spirit of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.